do you look back on that now and are you are you happy that you had the experience to have learned from that or is that just a chapter you would have rather not even had to experience I don't have regrets so I needed it and I'm glad I had it and I'm glad I'm over it you know is is what we call determinism or destiny actually just the free will of the higher self of us in our higher self form and that's why they abstained from it I'm like oh well that makes a lot of sense because Otherwise, you're just doing something for no reason with no intention. And when you have no intention, it's just mental and not physical and not emotional. One day I realized much later in life that I had to add an E in between the C and the T and make it facet. That what I had believed was the fact related to some topic might actually just be one facet of a larger prism of a larger truth. Danica Patrick. Wow. The famous and incredible Danica Patrick. It is so great. What a pleasure to have you here on this podcast. And I'm just so excited to uh, to see you. And I love your yellow sweater mm -hmm. that you're wearing, too. It's sort of mm -hmm. got this kind of like matchy thing going on with my light blue. Well, you know, in the quantum field, we 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 orchestrated that. That you know what that's I guess that's what they say when they say do you guys like dress together in the dark or something like that you know it's one of those type deals I guess but great to see you and uh, how's the weather there in Arizona today you no know, it's finally sunny I know we had to have a redo of this because mm -hmm. there was a storm that came through and my router went out um, but it's back to sunny cold but sunny <laughs> awesome good to have you so you know I have been curious. As the moment I found out that you were doing this podcast, your own podcast, and you've done so many of them now, how many have you done now? You've done, gosh. I've done towards 200. 200, 200. Yeah. So what was it that got you into that? And if you could kind of give me the background story of how you went from like incredible race car driver that everybody knew, tell me how you got into this whole sort of physics, uh, mathematics interest, uh, life and consciousness orientation, you know, what happened? How, how did you go from being the race car driver that everyone knew to being who you are now? Well, first and foremost, you have to be comfortable being who you are, but you also have to have space for that. And so I just never really had space to show this, these, these interests in this side of me when I was racing. I mean, it was like, you know, how was the car? You have five minute interviews, seven minute interviews, sometimes 30 seconds. Um, so, and you were, you were promoting your sponsors and you were talking about what was happening on track. So there wasn't really a lot of space for this kind of interest to be made, to be, to be revealed or made known. Um, but my, my interest in esoteric knowledge and, um, curiosity of the occult is tracks all the way back to when I was a kid. Like I've always been interested in astrology and psychics and, you know, even religion. I always remembered asking a lot of questions and I, I was, I was, I didn't, it wasn't that I didn't believe it. It was just that I had so many questions and curiosities and maybe there was a side of me that was trying to poke holes in it, but I was really vetting it out to see like what was true and what was not like, for instance, the, the the whole don't eat meat during Lent thing. I remember wondering about that because way back in the day, I got confirmed Catholic when I got married. So like I went through cataclysm classes and all the things. Um, and I remember asking about that and someone said it was- Is it, is it, is it cataclysm or catechism? It should be the first. Cataclysm, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, exactly. um, it's, uh, I don't know if they liked my questions so much, but- <laughs> um, knowing that meat was a luxury and that's why they abstained from it. I'm like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense because otherwise you're just doing something for no reason with no intention. And when you have no intention, it's just mental and not physical and not emotional. And so essentially there's like, like a significantly, or if not any connection to it whatsoever, you're just, you're just a robot. And so, um, so I would just ask a lot of questions and, um, yeah, I would say that like when I was 18, I got a psychic reading for my 18th birthday. I was living in England at the time too, racing. So Where'd you live in England? I lived in Milton Keynes. Oh, I know where exactly where that is. Yeah. I used to live in England too. Did you where? Cambridge. Much nicer, much at least much more integrity. 
Milton Keynes was just an overspill city for London with a good train mm -hmm. system that got you into Euston Station in 45 mm -hmm. minutes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, nobody really is nobody. Nobody English likes Milton Keynes whatsoever, um, and I don't necessarily blame them. But then again, I don't really like the whole country. So, um, <laughs> that's pretty. Funny. And I also don't beat around the bush. So. Uh, my, I'm a little bit more healed than I used to be about England and, you know, my formula one experience and working can with I, the can I ask, team. What was it, if you're okay saying, it, what was it you didn't like about the country? Well, it was cold and rainy and dark and the, you know, so the weather sucked and the food sucked. I mean, the food in general, unless you like have a bunch of money or in London, it, it, the food is not very good. Um, I didn't like that. There was no breakfast options. Like, barely any, um, what else? And I didn't really love my experience with the people. Like, I'm not saying they were all British. A lot of them were, but I just, my, my whole experience in England, which ends up putting me like emotionally making me not like England, but because of my experience in England, which had to do with so many other people and parts. Um, I just didn't feel like I really, like the people were not genuine. I don't, I never came away with a real friend. I left England after three years and no one ever called me. I called people for like six months. I remember, you know, just keeping up with your friends. I was 19 when I left and nobody ever called me. And after six months, I, I, I got the message. He's just not that into you, but meaning like nobody was no girls, no guys, like nobody was really my friend. So I just, uh, I just didn't like my experience. So that's why I don't like England. What was it that brought you there in the first place? Racing. Yeah. Racing. Yep. I met somebody back when I was 14 that was British and I guess I just asked all the right questions. And um, when I was 16, him and the family he worked for contacted me about racing to see if I wanted to go to England racing. And, uh, and so then I did. They told me I could learn more in five, more in one year in England than five years in the United States. And I was like, well, that sounds like a smart deal. So I went over there for three years, didn't learn shit about race cars at all. But you know what? I learned a lot about life. I learned a lot about, you know, the dangers of being naive, the da dangers of trusting. Um, and so I, I got a, I got a thick shell and I'm sure it served me well moving forward, but it was a, it was a, it was a tough experience for sure. Um, maybe, you know, it's one thing that's funny about this. Way. One funny point to note is, you know, you can pretty much go to any kind of restaurant in the United States. I, there's like, almost every kind of restaurant you can imagine, right? Whether it's Mexican or Italian or French, right? But you won't find many English restaurants. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not a lot to write home about. No, no. The food, actually, the only food I love in England, to be honest, is Indian food. Indian oh, food yeah. in London is quite good. That's they the only thing. They do a good job of that. You're yes, right, they, do. they do. Other than that, I mean, yeah. I mean, the queen... She's dead now. So anyway, um, whatever. Um, I don't know. Old paradigm. No, you know, that's a, that's a, do you look back on that now? And are you, are you happy that you had the experience to have learned from that? Or is that just a chapter you would have rather not even had to experience? I don't have regrets. So I needed it and I'm glad I had it and I'm glad I'm over it. But if you had to, if I had to go do it again, I wouldn't. You wouldn't um, choose you know, I, I, but I'm just not one of those people that looks back in my life with regret because regret implies regret keeps you stuck. Regret implies that you want a, your past to be different than what it was. And you yeah. can't ever change that. Mm -hmm. You can maybe reorient your memory through some EMDR or something like that, but you mm -hmm. can't actually change the objective past. And so, um, so I don't have regret. I might have things I'm bummed about or things that were hard, but I definitely believe that, you know, in the sliding doors, butterfly concept, you know, it's, it's, I believe that everything happens and rolls into the next thing. And so I don't want to change my past because it would change where I am today. Do you feel the same way about worry as you do about regret? No, I should really get over that though. <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a, um, like women, especially if we're looking at like personality traits, um, with human beings women usually rank pretty high on neuroticism and um, I don't like, I am not neurotic whatsoever. So I don't, I really don't worry that much. Maybe that's why I laugh it off because um, 
I just, I really do have a perspective that I think everything will work out. I, well, I, my sense on you is you're one of the most grounded women I've ever met. Aww. And that's true. Very true. You're very matter of fact and practical uh, in how you look at the world and also curious, which along with your curiosity comes like a certain humility that could be mistaken potentially for naivete. Mm. Um, and I could see why you raised that, but I, oh, since we've gotten to know each other, I've, I've been like thoroughly impressed with how you perceive the world and your genuine curiosity to learn, which I think is, uh, is really cool. Thank you. So, that means a lot coming from you. Cause you, uh, you're a very smart guy. You're a very, very accomplished, very wise, um, successful human being. Uh, and so Thank you for saying that. I appreciate well, that. Thank you. Well, thank you. So, so how did you then get into kind of this whole yeah. questioning the reality of life and what we're dealing with? Well, and we'll come back to the worry question in a little okay, bit. Okay. Okay. I actually have a question, like a little bit of a curiosity that we could mm -hmm. debate first. And sure. I'm wondering how much of, how much of how we are comes in with us and how much, how much are, how much awareness do we have and how much does that vary from person to person? Because I'm asking that because mm -hmm. I don't feel like I, I feel like I have it in me. Like I, mm -hmm. I feel like I have a natural awareness, knowing and curiosity for sort of spiritual esoteric mm -hmm. things. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I mean, other than my dad joking about, you know, who built the pyramids in Egypt growing up. Mm -hmm. And he's like the aliens, you know, other than that, like I came from like a very blue collar meat and potatoes kind of a family. It was not super out there. I didn't have some hippie mom or dad. I, we didn't go do like meditation. I mean, no, none of that at all. So I'm wondering just me neither, by the way, really? Yeah. How much it just I, comes in? Like what, what makes us who like land in the spots that we are and having this kind of a conversation? I think what it comes, at least I can only speak for myself, but I, yeah. I believe that there's a certain aspect of it that is nurtured, mm -hmm. right? Through our own conditioning biases and whether we say that that thing is something that was possibly chosen by us, right? In some path prior to coming here, uh, I, I, I actually kind of tend to believe that more than anything else, that even the experiences themselves are chosen by us in a form of a higher self mm -hmm. and that everything is so perfectly tied together. I could give you some examples of this. Like this week I had kind of a, a, a really big important announcement thing that came out on one of my, on one of my companies that's in healthcare also. And when I first started my group of companies in 2011, which is exactly on December 13th, um, I didn't even realize that the day that this announcement went out was the exact same day, 11 years to the day. And I had at that time actually had the idea that I was going to start the company with the name AEON, Aeon. And it, it had some symbolic importance to me for some reason. I kept seeing me like ringing the bell on the stock exchange with AEON. And I've taken two other companies public before this as well, but they weren't the name AEON. So they were bittersweet. It was like, it wasn't the one I had dreamt of. It wasn't the one I had seen, you know, in advance because I was so committed to that concept. And I looked up the name AEON and, you know, it means, it, it, and one of the meanings it can have is I am. It also means God, right? Mm. It has a significance. So it's a Greek word for God for time is another uh, meaning for Aeon, like an Aeon of time. Eons of, um, time. eons of time. It's from the same root. Um, mm -hmm. uh, even Carl Jung wrote a book called Aeon. Aeon with an I, which is the same word. It's just, you know, a different Greek spelling for it, but it's the same exact meaning of the word. Uh -huh. And the word had significance in the reverse as well, because Greek words have meanings both directions. So no way, which would be Aeon backwards, is from noetics, basically cognitive sciences. So I think is no way. And I am is Aeon. I think, therefore, I am. So I thought that's kind of a cool name to come up with. Uh, back when I first had this idea, I looked up if there were other companies that already had the name, and there were. There was a company at Healthcare that had the name, so I had to give up and abandon that as an idea. 
Well, along the way, that company ended up getting sold and was gone. And, and so I was able to found another company in 2018 called Aon. And now that is going to be listed on the stock exchange under the name AEON. Now, it, it went through a very circuitous journey to get there, but the exact vision of what I saw is likely to come in the near future now. And, and so I have to ask the question, right? It's like, how much of that, was it just that idea that I committed to as to why it ended up that way? I Honestly, I don't know. But the, the fact that it had to go through so many different iterations along the way and then ended up exactly as I'd seen in the beginning kind of leads me to believe that it was kind of known and predetermined from the beginning. Very and, good question. Free will versus and, determinism. Yeah. And so maybe, and like we talked about this on the podcast we did before, you know, is, is what we call determinism or destiny actually just the free will of the higher self of us in our higher self form. And when you think about timelines time. and you think about time space realities and if, you know, if, or because, I mean, I don't know if we can know this for sure, but if everything exists simultaneously, then everything is now it's right there. That's right. Everything is now. And maybe, you know, even our perception of time itself is really just a persistent attachment we have to duality. Mm, explain that more. Duality, so how past, duality and time. Past really? and future is a, a, a way we separate out, mm. you know, another way of looking at a oh. one and a zero. Huh. Mm. Right. So, and actually everything is in the now. And maybe if we looked at all the circumstances in our life, from a non-dualistic perspective, maybe we would say, well, everything has a facet. It's not a fact, it's a facet. So there might be a facet of this that's positive, but the same thing could have a negative aspect associated with it. It's all in our perception. So I, I, I used to think that facts were facts and facts and facts. And so one day I realized much later in life that I had to add an E in between the C and the T and make it facet. That what I had believed was the fact related to some topic might actually just be one facet of a larger prism of a larger truth. What Maybe time if, is the same. What if what we are considering to be linear here is just our consciousness? I guess you have to give that sort of a mm -hmm. solid sort mm -hmm. of like, you know, perspective. What if it is just dancing in timelines? Yeah. And so you saw it, you hopped a little timeline. Mm -hmm. Maybe we stay sort of close within sort of our range, but what if it's not past and future? It's just our hopping of timelines and choices lining us up with a vertical stack of all things happening simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. <gasps> and, and, and that, that actually connects and it's very similar to how I see it. It connects with retro causality. So everything is retro causal. Mm. That means that the future determines the past as much as the past determines the future. It's, you know, yesterday I had a chance to catch up with Nassim Haramain, who I hadn't seen in quite oh, some time. Love, love Nassim. And I, I had lunch with him and we oh. were talking, I, we were talking about, uh, you know, this notion of, of, you know, zero point energy and, and retro causality. And, and he, he says, oh, you know what? I think it all comes down to a certain type of Taurus. It's not a Taurus with a donut hole in the center. It's a Taurus that is a horned Taurus. And I'm like, well, Taurus usually has horns in the sim. <laughs> and he wasn't even thinking of it that way. But these are inverted horns that come into a singularity point. And I think there's something very it's more interesting complicated about this because, than a donut. Well, yeah, because what it does is it becomes more like a Klein Taurus. You've heard of a Klein bottle? No. A Klein bottle is like a bottle that inverts within itself. So like you maybe seen it, it looks like this weird thing that's got this tube sticking out of it. Oh. And in the beginning, you're pouring something into it, but then it goes on the outside of it. Okay. Okay. So it's like, a, cool. you know what a Mobius strip is? A Mobius strip would be a, a strip of paper and you're going to make like little bracelets like when we were kids in elementary school. You take this strip of paper, you twist it mm -hmm. and then tape it to the other side yeah, so it's yeah, got yeah. the twist in it 
Yep. It's like an Escher drawing. You think you're on the outside of something, you actually become on the inside of something just by continuing on that thing. Yeah. And that time is likely related to that. And that's the only way that it could be possible, in my view, to have everything be retrocausal, that there is destiny. But what we think in this world, in this limited frame, right, where we put this sort of block in a way, you know, the, if you wanted to learn something, the very best way to learn something is going to be through experiential learning. Yeah, for sure. So, but not only experiential learning, it's going to be blinded experiential learning. Yeah, that's the only real way, true way. If you had all the answers, you wouldn't really, it wouldn't really land. That's right. So the blinding aspect of it is what you're pointing to right now by asking that question, how much do we come in with? I think we come in with all of it. Yeah, yeah. I think that as we expand consciousness and learn to transcend duality, breaking the notions of past and future as being separate, breaking the notionality that I'm separate from you, mm. as we start to break away from that concept, then we start to experience and remember the things that we actually have always had access to, but had limited ourselves from being able to see because we are blinded so that we can have the learning experience and the realization. Mm. Because once we have that realization, then it feels extremely divine. And, and I, I think that really resonates and, and it, it's very much in line with what you were just saying about how everything is like a dance through these different timelines, Right. And it's consciousness sort of playing. And this is very much how Alan Watts would describe it, right? It's something called Leela. Once mm -hmm. we understand that we've been in samsara and the cycle of samsara, once you break through that cycle of samsara, which requires a transcendence in a, in a form of, of duality, no longer clinging to this notion of fact, but actually embracing the notion of facet, then you start to go in this realm that he calls Leela, which is like playing in the game. And, That's and a big it's question, man, how do we play this game? How do we play this game and how do we play it so that we get the maximum learning? And the beauty of it is, if you believe what I just said, then everything is already predetermined. So there's really no mistakes and there's no need to then regret. And there's also likely no need then to worry. You know, I, I wrote a post the other day. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but I wrote a post on it. It was like, it came to this realization after I realized that this 13 year or 11 year anniversary happened on the exact date of this. And, and I was like, wow, that's really interesting because our thoughts really do become reality. And I hadn't even connected the two things at that time. And then I thought, but then what is it that causes the time delay for that thought to become reality? And I realized that what caused the time delay was all the moments and times that I was worried that it wouldn't come true. Mm-hmm gripping grasping it's the you know it's it's when you want something when you want something especially if you want it so badly this is usually the main problem is that you are carrying that energy of not having attachment it. yeah attachment and you're and the energy is also i don't have it when you therefore want the universe so repels it from you exactly it's like at least a moot point right mm -hmm. and so as you know maybe you or people listening will think of these scenarios after i give this concept but when you have something that you think of that you don't really care about you're like oh man oh yeah totally. i'd love to go there or oh that'd be fun to do that or oh you know i'd like to meet that person and then you just kind of forget or let go because it's really not that important to you and then all of a sudden it it makes its way into your reality and you're like oh cool yeah, i was totally just talking about this i'm so glad and it's because you don't like you let it go so you know being able to detach is you know I think it's a real challenge for sure. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very curious what is innate and sort of fixed within this experience of being a human. And if there are just things as being a human that like, I'm thinking like we can evolve and grow and what happens when we go into fifth dimensional reality? What happens when we go into unity consciousness? Does that mean we're human anymore? I don't really know. But at least in this game that we're playing as we know it right now, what are the things, what things are fixed within this experience that you can't, you have, you just have to deal with, whether it be duality or whatever we were just talking about? You know, it's interesting you say that because I tend to see it. I'd love to hear your thoughts back on this, but I tend mm -hmm. to see it as we call ourselves human beings, but 
until now, um, we've really been human doings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I believe that there is a future ahead of us that is truly an evolved human being. Mm -hmm. That it's not only about toil and work and, you know, consumerism and adding to our portfolio and all of these things, but actually just being comfortable in the authentic beingness of who we are. It's the I amness. And I, I fundamentally believe that that's what we're evolving towards. And that's why we've chosen this exact circumstance, you know, with all this dystopian kind of backdrop and that everything has to remain in balance. So as we raise our consciousness, that there will be an equal opposite reaction, right? So the backdrop becomes darker so the light can shine brighter. You know, I like to you know, put a beautiful diamond in front of a black velvet piece of cloth so that I can see the facets of the diamond more clearly and the light refraction off of it and diffraction. And without that black background, it just doesn't look as brilliant. And I think it's the same thing with how consciousness works. Hmm. That there are varying degrees of backdrop. The light needs the dark in order for it to shine its brightest. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just part of the nature of the universe. It's just like all these movies that have basically been, you know, in the public uh, sort of pop uh, culture for the last 20, 30 years. You know, you have like Lord of the Rings, which every time they introduce a new concept of magic mm. or even Game of Thrones there's always some like orc that has to show up in the picture, right? There's got to be some sort of like evil, dark warlord type of thing. And they yeah. come together. You know, you have, Luke Skywalker is going to show up around the time that you're going to start learning about Darth Vader, right? It's like this absolute battle in a way until you realize that it's symbiotic. The two actually require each other. And I think that's what humanity is exactly. starting to learn through. Yeah, and that's it's, him. It's you just talked loop. to him yesterday. That's mm -hmm. the feedback loop. Is it's that the feedback loop. Exactly. You have to, if you don't have information like yes and no, positive, negative, if you don't have that feedback loop, how do you have any kind of growth, evolution, or progress? Now, I get a little complex, but I guess when you throw in the, uh, the idea of entropy and things going towards more chaos, that I'm not sure how that fits in, but at least from Nassim's perspective and, you know, under, you know, with the idea of making progress and growing, you need a feedback loop and the positive and negative and the light and the dark is part of that feedback loop. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I believe fundamentally that as you increase entropy, right, there has to be a, an equal opposite reaction of syntropy, which is neg entropy or the opposite of entropy. So I look at the universe um, as like, a, you know, we talk about Big Bang. I'm not really a fan of Big Bang Theory. I believe it's inhalation and exhalation happening simultaneously. So I you can think of it as a mirror of consciousness. I just interviewed a girl. She goes by The Alchemist on Instagram and um, YouTube. Uh, Sarah is her name. And um, we were talking about entropy and how it's that, that you sent essentially entropy and alchemy like the way that you the way that you correct entropy is with alchemy to to change its form so what i thought of when you said that is that as entropy continues mm -hmm. just like you know we can look at this on all levels right this is i mean i do believe the universe is fractal um mm -hmm. me too if we're like let's say there's a problem here um, within the, with, within your relationship or whether there's a problem politically or whether there's a problem culturally, you go in and you try and fix it. So you go in with alchemy. So the more chaos there is, the more alchemy is coming in to yes. fix it. Yes. So that's almost the balancing act to entropy is alchemy. Yes. Well, and you could think of it like this as well. Yeah, you could say alchemy and syntropy are kind of in the same bucket, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and syntropy is just a word that was sort of coined by uh, Buckminster Fuller. Mm -hmm. But, you know, negentropy is kind of the more scientific term for the same thing. It's just mm -hmm. the opposite of, of entropy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't even have a real way to measure entropy, to be honest. We, we say we do scientifically, but, I mean, I make a random number generator. We The way we measure entropy is really just another way of looking at uniform distribution. 
In other words, what comes to you from a numerical perspective, you could say space-time would be like a string of numbers too. It's another way of looking at it. Um, you would have no more ability to predict the very next digit that came at you than the last one. It's completely uniform. So there'd be an equal number of ones, an equal number of twos, an equal number of threes, equal number of fours, fives and sixes, sevens, eights and nines. But if I grabbed a book, so if I grabbed this book right here and I were to count the number of times the number one shows up, you would think it would be kind of random, right? It's not, it's not random. So the number of times, and this is something called Benford's law, the number of times that the number one will appear if I pull a random selection of a newspaper will be 34% of the time compared to all the other numbers. So it's already outsized because it would be to 10% if it were exactly, you know, equal, right? Yeah. If you include zero in that mix, we would be one okay. out of 10. So then you've got the first number one is 34%. Number two is 17%. Number three is 12%. Number four is like 8%. And then it goes all the way down, gets smaller and smaller. This is called Benford's law. So oh. breaking out of Benford's law is not easy from a, how do you construct a random number generator perspective? So I look at, you know, randomness and entropy is really just an inability to perceive an encryption that's there. That's a larger pattern than we can see, but does actually, they still exist. So is it a level we, of consciousness that can, that that's only dealing with the, the numbers? Like, is it our, is it just our programming? Like our, our, our level of consciousness, our dimensional awareness, is it just yes where we're at that creates that the the percentages the way they are and that we need to like in some other time space reality or some other entity is operating with a more complicated different percentage yeah number. that's exactly Maybe right there's more number and there's more numbers more combinations more potentials yep. we just can't fathom it we just can't fathom it and and you use a good word fathom because fathom is six feet and fathom is actually derived, you know, from we, we say that we're plumbing the depths of something, right? We're getting in deep on something. And as we get deeper and deeper into that, we always will use the term fathom. And we also use it to describe what we can wrap our arms around. So it literally means to wrap your arms around something. It looks like Vitruvian oh, Man. I love that. And, but it also, when I looked at it, I was like, isn't it interesting that it looks like the words father and mother mashed together? It's just one direction from left to right is father and the direction from right to left is mother. <laughs> so you've got father, mother. And then when you start looking at it and you go, well, okay, so what's the meaning of that? Six feet. Well, six feet, which, you know, even the Vitruvian man, his arms length to length were 7.2 inches. So that's 72 inches, just multiply that by 10. And when you look at it in that context, then you'd say, well, what if I subtract the meter from that? Meter is 3.281 feet. So six feet minus 3.281 feet equals the Euler number? What? It's a mathematical constant? So Universe. another way to say it is six just feet math. minus Euler equals the meter? Hmm. And then if I take the Royal Egyptian cubit, that's the Euler number minus one. So then I have one and that's one foot. 1. 1.718 is the Royal Egyptian cubit, which is what the pyramids were built off of. And then I add the meter to that and it all adds up together to exactly six feet. The father, mother. <laughs> so oh my God. Then I mean, you it just makes you wonder. I just, it just, all those, that kind of thing just makes me wonder how what what creates this reality it feels very math based it doesn't feel it doesn't feel feminine it feels masculine in that nature like it feels it feels um boxy it feels feels like there's not room for curves it's just it fits into an algorithm a computer but we love the curve oh yeah of course we love the curve right even in racing i'm sure you love the curve we all love the curve and that golden ratio is what is so amazing. All the curves, you know, even down to true, golden ratio. It's, true. it's actually the curve that it's is the, the symbol for you the know, math. Like, and we use the what term the like, hell? life threw a curveball at me. Everything is about a curve and that's where we get our greatest learning, I think. And 
being Women. able to accept the irrational. <laughs> yes, that's right. Being able to accept the irrational nature of the curve. Yeah. And actually, the Royal Egyptian cubit has the curve embedded into it because that value of 1.718, which is Euler minus one, is actually a curvilinear value. It's perfectly oriented to curvilinear nature of things. Why? Because it, in meters, it's equal to 0.5236 meters, which is pi over six. Pi is irrational. Pi over six. So just take one pizza and cut it into six slices that are equal. And one of the slices arc will be the cubit. And by the way, if I make that pizza, guess how exactly long the radius of that pizza will be one meter. So a pizza cut into six slices will have an arc for each slice that is pi over six meters, right? Or 1.718 feet. And we'll have a radius of exactly one meter. And if I take an exact pendulum that is one meter in length and I swing it exactly 30 degrees of arc, it will take precisely one second to traverse each direction of that 30 degrees of arc that is the Royal Egyptian cubit. Why do things fit into a framework like this? Because they're planned and it's because it's a matrix. And this consciousness- This reality is a matrix. Yeah. Or the entire universe is a matrix, or at least the the knowable universe that we're. I believe it's a you know after you interviewed uh, Donald Hoffman, right? And and I've spent a lot of time with him since then as well, in part thanks to you. Um, basically, it was a pretty interesting discussion we had, and and you know, I'm going to have him on my podcast as well. But his comment to you about the latest Nobel Prize actually proving that local realism is false uh, was is very, very powerful. Yeah, I mean, it's a different reality. In my opinion, that proof, that, that being out there now, it just literally, it's like, it's like, it's like the impetus to a new paradigm. It has to be. It is entire. Yeah, because now, what is that impact? So after I watched the podcast with you, and uh, and then I had the chance to, even before I watched that podcast, I had the chance to have dinner with Donald. Um, and then I spent four hours in my office with him last week, which was amazing. So cool. But the thing that is interesting about it to me is, is I couldn't think, I started by thinking, what are all the things that this changes about our existence? Yeah, exactly. And I had to flip it very quickly to, what are the things this doesn't change? Okay. What'd you come up with? <laughs> Very few things. Right. Like literally it changes everything. Think about it. Biology is based on physics. I mean, you could start with mathematics. Applied mathematics is geometry. Applied geometry is physics. Applied physics is chemistry. Applied chemistry is biology. What if we prove our bodies are not there while we sleep because our consciousness is not on it? And if nobody's observing it, even our biological body might not be there. What if that happens? That's uh, I think we could definitely have a trip out discussion on some <laughs> mushrooms with that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like the same question of if I'm not observing the moon and no one else is, is it even there? And that's what Donald was saying straight up. He's like, look, if you're not, if no one's observing something, then it is, it doesn't hold a position. And then you asked, what does it mean to not hold a position? It means it's not there. So that means that your entire body is also not necessarily there. Unless Which we're makes sense it. based on going into dream, dream time, dreamland. Right? Uh, maybe it's like in the movie Avatar, which is funny that the new version of it's coming out, you know, right now. Yeah. yeah but, sure. but, you know, you go into this thing. Maybe we're laying in some like jello vat somewhere. Like in the Matrix. Like in the Matrix, right? Which is like, and and just having this mental experience that's just a dream within a dream within a dream, like extending time so that we have this experience of multiple, multiple lifetimes. Who knows, right? So I, I think all of these questions now have to be asked because if if the fundamental root of it is mathematics and then that mathematics becomes geometry that then becomes chem uh, physics and then physics becomes chemistry and then chemistry becomes biology and biology becomes psychology and psychology becomes sociology sociology becomes philosophy and and applied philosophy becomes mathematics again it's just a circle 
The loop's I back mean, on itself. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was, uh, oh my God, that's a clip right there. That's perfect. That is so freaking brilliant. So everything is impacted by the notion that local realism is false. All learning, how, all history. How would you, okay, I think there's a difference between knowing, well, I know there's a difference between knowing and embodying and feeling. Like the idea that this house is not here or this table or microphone or whatever is not here unless observed is something I can't embody yet. But let's still use the mind in this land. If that being true, how would you or will you live your life different? I think I would live my, and I've been asking myself this question a lot for the last few weeks because I think the, the first conclusions I came to is why worry about anything? Okay. Why stress about things? There's kind of because no Because it's not there because. Yeah. And, and by the way, the things that you're stressing about, you're only creating more inertia and impediment to you actually getting those things. Right. Like, like your company that you didn't get for a while. That's right. That's exactly right. So how much of maybe if I, I mean, I think everything is predetermined, but what it does now is makes me question how long it should take to achieve things. Because when I realize that I'm actually the source of the impediments to achievement. (laughs) Now, when you get out of the way, and Time everybody, I'm sure you up. saw this and I'm sure you saw this in race car driving, right? It's always, we are always our own worst enemies. Yeah, totally. It's, it's always a mental game and that's true. And, you know, like single player sports or multiplayer sports or multiplayer game environments, we're always our own worst enemies. It's the people that in, in tennis, you know, it's like, they call it unforced errors. Yeah. And these are errors that weren't really something that you should have had. It, it was just you making your own mistake because you sort of lost your mental, uh, your strength of, of mental fortitude of this is what I can do. This is what I'm going to achieve. So now it makes me really question, okay, the entire nature of reality and my thoughts really can become reality. And the only thing that slows those thoughts down from becoming reality are my own thoughts. So, the only thing that is the only obstacles that become real in this world, it's not somebody else's fault. It's mine. It's, it's what I wanted to learn, what I wanted to experience. And I wanted to have a blinded experiential learning. So what's the reframe? How do you get yourself out of the way? What's the reframe? So I think awareness of it is nine tenths of it. Yeah. 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 It's like almost like it feels like it sets it in motion and it's on its way. And it's like, it's just a matter of how long it takes for it to land and be embodied, but it's on its way. Yeah. But it's always been like this. That's the thing. It's always been like this. It's just us. Again, it's been something that went from entropic Mm -hmm. and random and coincidental to now realizing that, no, I'm the creator. And if I'm the creator, then what do I want to create? And how do I become one with that higher self? So that I realize that I've sort of, you know, gotten to the stage now where I don't need to learn these same principles over and over and again, because I'm done with my cycle of repetition. Then where do you go? And then where do you go? Well, I mean, that's where I think you can start to go into human beingness. Well, I was thinking of um, some words around that. And when you said it and um, human being, human doing is what we've been and doing is reaching human being is accepting. Yes. So beautiful, beautiful. If we stop reaching, stop doing, and we start being and accepting, then we don't, we're not grasping anymore. And essentially that should speed everything up. If you have an intention to want something that now should, and maybe that's part of this sort of like timeline speeding up or time speeding up is that we're entering a dimension where we're starting to understand our part in making it happen. Yeah. I mean, and I think words matter. It's sort of like this no way and aeon. I think therefore I am. 
Don't you know, words can... fit in? Don't words just kind of fit into the math as well, though? Yes, perfect. Words, letters, yes. sounds, like it all it's, fits It's like the measurements. The, the things that we think are arbitrary, that somebody well, just decided arbitrarily, you come to the realization that, no, it was all part of the teaching. And even the word time. I mean, look at the word time. Two sides of this. Emit, we talked about this last time. Emit is like emission of light. Time is like gravity. It's absorption of light. Mm -hmm. So you've got emit and time. What a coincidence. But the other way of looking at it is it's just me, it, me. So see, in the other dimensions though, and you know, whether you've taken plant medicine or some crazy, you know, journey with meditation or some transcendental experience you had spontaneously, um, words aren't there anymore. Words are part of this matrix because in my, this is what's feeling true for me, because in those other spaces, places, and dimensions, that's not this one, you come into a knowing, like, it's yeah. not like you hear the words. It's not like a linear, it just arrives. It's like, it's not even a, rem it's not even a remembering. It's a knowing you come into an awareness as if again, all of those timelines are stacked and you're like, oh, I'm there. I just know that. Yeah. And, and then so like. A millisecond. I don't know if this is, if it's this way for you too, but not only do you have that realization in a millisecond, but it connects all these dots yeah. from your whole life. Yeah. And then that's like when you get the mind blowing like, like emoji, oh. right? Yeah. And so words, yeah, they're powerful, but they're here. They're this. That's part of this construct. Yeah. And I love that moment of realization. Yeah. That moment of realization when you like connect the dots, just like you did a little while ago, that's like, that's something to live for. It really is. I mean, it's something to they live happen for. a lot with you. You help connect a lot of dots, my friend. And <laughs> you, you do too. connect them yourself too. <laughs> and you do, you definitely do. And you know, one of the things I was just telling this story about how I, uh, you know, that we all perceive, because Donald asked me the question when he was here in the office, he said, what do you think about emotions? Do you think we can ascribe emotions mathematically? Can we put a mathematical equation to an emotion? Right. And, and he's like, for how does a, you know, a piece of chocolate taste versus another piece of chocolate? And I said, I believe you can. I absolutely believe you can. And he said, well, how would you go about describing that mathematically? And I said, well, first of all, you have to realize that each of us probably has a number, right? And then our experience is one over that number. And then that number converts into a light matrix. And that light matrix then gets reflected back to us from its absorption. So we literally have a universe, you and a you inverse. That's the world that you're living in. That's your pattern of repetition. And along with that would be your set conditioning biases, the patterns that you have over and over again, because you take a one over a number and it has a long period cycle of a repeating value that just keeps repeating infinitely. Mm. It's not irrational. So that means then that the experiences that we have cannot be looked at other than through a subjective lens. And I'll give you an example of this. I was at this uh, restaurant in Chicago in 2007. Mm -hmm. And it was called Charlie Trotter's. It was like a famous oh, yeah. restaurant. Yeah, it's They're a famous not open agent. anymore. Yep. He died but, too. <laughs> he died. And I liked the restaurant. So I was there one night with a friend of mine named Vance Thompson, who is the owner of Jessup Winery in uh, Napa. Mm-hmm. And um, he's a great guy. We had two other people with us and they had this competition and they often had this and they would come around with the sommelier would come around with a bottle of wine and he'd have a towel wrapped around this bottle of wine. And he said, if you can guess the appellation, right. Oh and God. the vintage of this so wine, fun. I love doing that. If you can guess this, then your dinner's free here at Charlie Trotter, which is like, That's okay, so cool. Fun. And we, and you get your picture on the wall. And, and of course they're going around and nobody gets this. And, but I had spent a summer learning La Degustation in France, in Bordeaux. So I, I had a little bit of an advantage. So I'm like, okay, bring it. And I'm not even a big wine drinker. I just wanted to learn the concept of wine tasting. So I did. And I learned all the different aspects of it and everything over a summer when I was in grad school. Well, he goes to the first guy, the one that owned Jessup. And he says, you know, pours it for him. and Vance is like swishing the wine and he smells it. He's like, I'm sure it smells like a Malbec. This is a Malbec. He's like, it's Argentine. And then, you know, the next person tries, they're like, 
Uh, I see this. It's more like a Chianti to me. It's got like an Italian aspect to it. Well, there's a very distinct smell of a wine cask in this in Bordeaux area. Mm. It's this particular white oak that they have. Mm. And when he poured the wine for me and I smelled the bouquet, I was like, that smells just like Bordeaux. And I remember that smell very, very well. Mm -hmm. And then I started using deductive and inductive kind of reasoning on this because I started sure. thinking about it as I'm like, okay, well, this is Charlie Trotter's. There's only like 10 appellations that, that are show up time. in the United States. Yeah. So Santa Million, Santa Stoff, San Julian, Pomerol, right? All these different wines. And, yeah. and, and I'm like, none of those are expensive enough to be at Charlie Trotter, right? Puyak. Yeah, Puyak, Puyak is also good, but still not <laughs> expensive enough. What? And so I said, the only That's one where Rothschild comes from. <laughs> yeah, the Rothschild would also be very, very good. Yes, <laughs> you could definitely have you could, you know uh, uh, you could definitely have Rothschilds. The Rothschilds could be in the older vintages, definitely. But one mm -hmm. of the things I knew is that it was one of the newer vintages. How did I know? Well, because when you learn degustation, you take a sip of the wine, you swallow it, and then you see how long the taste remains in your mouth. Huh. And it, the number of seconds the taste remains in your mouth tells you the age of the wine. Ha! That's fantastic. Math. Math, exactly. <laughs> so I tasted it and it only had like a two second lingering aftertaste. So I'm like, it's only a couple years old. So it's got to be, you know, it's not going to be Mouton Roth Rothschild. It's not going to be one of the other ones. And I'm like, it's Chateau Margaux. <laughs> and I said, it's 2005 Chateau Margaux, two year old <laughs> vintage. And the guy was like, he took off the towel. He was like, oh, my God, you were right. You were right. You're freaking and, blind pouring you Mouton. That's fantastic. Yes, it was. It was epic. That's and so, and so, so he basically blind pours this for me and I and I guessed it. And, uh, and of course, I got the dinner for free. And every time I see this other guy that was there, Vance Thompson, he always tells the story. He's like, I didn't know Robert very well. But then I realized the guy is freaking James Bond because he pulled a blind pull on, you know, Chateau Margot. And. It was something that was profoundly important to me, not that I won that. The reason I wanted to learn this art of wine tasting was that I realized that every wine that I tasted tastes different because it is alchemizing with me. It's mm -hmm. not only the wine that is has its own distinct flavor. Each wine yeah. tastes different to each individual That's because it. it mixes and alchemizes differently with the palate of that person. Totally. Your pH, everything. Everything about it, right? Everything mm -hmm. about it. So what we think is an objective experience and we mm -hmm. apply like wine scores to something, right? You know, it's a mm -hmm. hundred point or 95 mm -hmm. point or whatever is subjective. entirely subjective. Yeah. Every single thing is subjective because we cannot remove our conditioning biases from that. I just had a conversation with this girl, Sarah, about that subjective mm -hmm. and objective reality. Mm -hmm. And what, and I said, I really question whether or not there's actually such thing as an objective reality, given the fact that we all see things through our own lens. And I use the example of, you know, if there's a car crash, four different people watch the car yeah. crash. They have no totally. reason to tell a different story. They all tell different stories. There's, and they all are trying to do their best. And even in that scenario, they can't tell four of the same stories. So what is, so is it possible to really have objective truth? And she said, the camera can see it. She goes, your higher self sees the objective reality. So the, this, the, this, the sort of gap between your ability to observe objective reality and see subjective reality is your ability and your level of consciousness to see the truth. Yeah, that's and what I mean. Be one I... with your higher self and be closer to the mm -hmm. oversoul higher self that is the observer, that is the camera, that does see things objectively. And I was like, but, but when you get to that stage, and I agree with that, but when you get to that stage, um, it's coming to the realization again that what you saw as fact previously was just facet. Okay. Because okay. the sum of all of those potential facets becomes the whole truth. And in that context, I think that's what she means by the objective reality. So I'll give you another story that's kind of interesting. I did a podcast with uh, with Lawrence Krauss, who's a famous physicist who uh -huh. uh, his research led to two Nobel Prizes. So that's pretty good for a physicist. And he was he was, you know, he worked at ASU and did his research there for quite some time as well. And 
I asked him a very vexing question for him, which is we're talking about information theory and we're talking about geometry. And Einstein believed that geometry was the foundational basis of gravity, not that it describes gravity, but that it actually is gravity. And so it's a vexing topic for the physics community a lot because when you start to look at how perfect geometry is, it's like this gigantic rapid realization that one fathom minus the Euler number equals the meter. Wait, I thought that was subjective. It's just thought, all over the place. You find it everywhere. What if consciousness just created all of it perfectly, right? And then he told me the number of bits of data in the universe is 10 to the 120th power. And I'm like, oh, well, that's 10 to the 12. Again, it's imperial and decimal. Because 120th, again, is just 10, 12 times 10, right? That's all that is. So you've got imperial and decimal. That's what our DNA is based off of. We have a pentagon for each nucleotide pair is a pentagon and two hexagons. Five, six, six. Double those and you got 10 and 12. It's imperial, decimal, and imperial relationships. The five, six relationship is the foundation of all life all DNA. And when I asked him the question about geometry, I could tell he was vexed by the question because it's not an easy answer. Who created the geometry? Where'd it come from? And he basically, you know, was like feeling uncomfortable and immediately his dog started barking like mad in the background. Hmm. Like he had like several dogs and I don't know where they were. They sounded like small dogs, like yappers. And they're like, bah, 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 bah. and he goes, my dogs don't like the concept of geometry. <laughs> and I'm thinking, he's thinking this is justification for him not answering the question of what is geometry. And I'm actually thinking, well, that's kind of funny because maybe it's your dogs telling you to listen how important geometry actually is to the universe. Right. Perception. <laughs> right. It's but perception, in, shift. In perception shift. Identical circumstance. I lived it through a plane crash in 19... 93 on Delta flight 88. And everyone that I fly with after that point, were like, we don't want to fly with you. Robert's super unlucky. And I'm like, no, I'm like the luckiest guy ever. You like I lived. I'm alive. I, I can talk about it. Right. Yeah. So it's all about each of us as individuals, as separations of the number one, we'll have all, all of us, our own subjective perspective. But if we can sum all of those together, and get at least 270 degrees of those, then you're starting to really push the boundary on wisdom. If you could start to empathize and see people's different perspectives, you're getting closer and closer to maybe a God level consciousness or a higher self level consciousness. Mm, well, because essential, well, supposedly we are all one, right? This is a, we are unity consciousness essentially. And so if you can, empathize meaning feel what they're feeling you're tapping into the whole yeah and i don't believe that we're here danica to learn more judgment i believe we're here to learn how to love i believe we're here to learn how to be loved and that's actually arguably harder than learning to love i think I don't know what you think, but I think that comes with learning how to love yourself completely. That's and I think I mean. that's a lot harder than it sounds. It is. It is a lot harder. And let's say that that was the gating item to being able to achieve enlightenment. Mm. True, authentic self-acceptance and true self-love. Because mm -hmm. if you have that, then you can love everybody else. Yep. Because it's just a mirror. It's just a mirror. That's right. So to me, it's that sum total and adding up of perspectives that is so valuable and maybe why we wanted to subject ourselves to this blinded experiential learning, or maybe it's a, a spiritual life simulation game. Mm. Right? That's how to think of it in one way. I, mm. I really believe that we are now on this verge of understanding human beingness. Human beingness will be achieved when we achieve a certain degree of self-love and can empathize because the empathy is directly related. People that say that they're woke, people that say they're woke, right? It's like if they're still judgmental, well, if they're saying they're if they're saying they're woke, then they are so not awakened, spiritually awakened because woke is negative. <laughs> yes, right. I, but they think it's like, yo, man, I'm woke. But here's the interesting part about it: it's like 
if anyone that claims to be spiritually awakened is still judgmental of other mm-hmm. people's actions, mm-hmm. they're not awakened. Mm-hmm. This is the acid test. It's the, it's the true acid test because as soon as anyone that I've known has been significantly awakened and has advanced along in the path, they stop looking to blame other people. Mm-hmm. And they realize that they themselves are the creator of their own experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then instead of saying, why did so-and-so hurt me this way? Why did they betray me that way? You start asking yourself, why did I choose this? Right. What is it within me? What's my part that put me in this position? And how do I not do it again? Right. What do I and need then, to feel that will not attract this kind of an experience? That's right. How do I stop judging everybody else for making similar mistakes? Because that's why I'm going to continue to make the same ones. What have you judged the most in your life? What are, what are you the most judgmental of? I'm going to say I am totally not in a point where I don't judge. I am. I am not awoke. I'm not spiritually enlightened. I am not. I'm not there yet, I don't think, if that's our criteria. Um, so I'm just throwing myself out there vulnerably to say, I, I got plenty of things I judge. So I'm just curious. Do you that have means that, you know, it's so funny. That's like, that's the reluctant, you know, the reluctant uh, spiritualist who would say something like what you just said. I, I think Alan Watts always says, you know, all of us should be able to admit that we're rascals. Rascals. Absolutely. Totally. It's actually like, yeah. And funny enough, he actually says like, you should, that's, that's a good thing to be able to say you're a rascal. Yeah, the only people you should be afraid of are the people that say they're totally good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because those are the ones that are going to probably do some of the worst things without even knowing that they're doing it because they're not even conscious of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all have dark shadows. Everybody does. There's yeah. no one that doesn't. And so this idea that we have to, I think the harshest thing I judged was myself. In what ways? I, I was always striving, you know, it's like I, I compare it to like a block of cheese. It's a bad analogy. I can't think of a better one. But so it's let's so say, sweet. let's say I have a block of cheese, right? This is, uh-huh. you know, some, some, uh, some cheese, cheddar cheese. <laughs> and, and I'm going to take a knife and I'm going to cut, right? Each time, let's say this corner was embarrassing to me. And I derived a lot of shame as a result of this edge and corner because I hurt another little kid when I was three years mm. old. So I'm going to cut this corner off. Mm. So if I cut this corner off, I'm going to wait for the next time. But I've also now formed two other corners, right? While I've mm-hmm. cut the corner off. Oh, yeah. And then, and then something else happens. I disobey my parents. So I cut off another corner because I don't want to feel ashamed again, you know, and I don't want to get punished again. And, and then I cut another corner off because I, I really, I did something bad. You know, I, stole some candy out of a store (laughs) and that brought me shame. And every time I did it, I'm like, I don't want to associate with that thing. I'm going to blame it on somebody else. I'm going to say, it's just like even in the garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve, God comes, Adam, what are you doing? It's like, Oh, the woman that thou gavest me and commanded I remain with her. She gave me the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which by the way is duality. And I did eat. Yeah. And then Eve, what hast thou done? Oh, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. The first thing we want to do whenever we feel shame is blame someone else, right? So I'm going to cut off another edge. I keep cutting off edges until at 45 years old, I'm a thin pillar of cheese and all the rest of it I've pushed off of me. And I've said, I want nothing to do with these things. That's not who I am. I am good. I don't do anything wrong, right? I keep striving for 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 excellence in the pursuit of of you know even better happiness and yet everything feels very very empty and yes while i achieve some degree of fleeting success it's not really lasting success because i feel like i'm caught on some crazy hamster wheel and where does it ever end and everyone around me should be striving in the same way that i have why can't they just strive and become this single pillar of cheese And then at a certain point, you go through a crisis. And that crisis then makes you realize that all this stuff that I'd cut off from me and separated from myself is me. And the only solution is to learn to accept all those things were me from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. 
And that is where the phoenix comes in, burns you to the ground where all the cheese pieces are lying. You then become a pool of cheese. It all unites again. I mean, this is literally supposed to be inspired by the phoenix rising. This as well. That's and then you become the pool of cheese, reorganized, alchemized back into your back into itself again. Start over. Yeah. And so it's funny because I remember uh, when whole. I was really studying whole alchemy, cheese. the whole you're you're back to the whole cheese. Holy now. cheese. You're back to the whole cheese. So the, the <gasps> thing is, is that I was studying alchemy and uh and of course, a um, fundamental aspect of alchemy is you start with negredo, then albedo, which is represented by the the crow, and then the swan, and then it goes to a peacock, and then peacock mm. to a pelican, which represents sacrifice and the marriage mm. of the red king and the white queen. And it's meeting the shadow and falling in love with that shadow aspect of yourself. Mm. So you can alchemize into this phoenix. And the phoenix is the final stage of this. And the, I remember the day I had the realization, and I was teaching it on Resonance Academy, and I was, uh, I had to stop in this office because my time for my class was there. I was there for work and I, I went over to, uh, I was in Scottsdale and I went to one of the offices that I was in. I said, can I use this office so I could teach this class? So it's all online. And, and I realized at that moment that I was teaching about the Phoenix while I was in Phoenix and that the shadow of the Phoenix is the Thunderbird mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in alchemy referred to as the Aquila. And then I realized wait, I went to MBA school at Thunderbird in Phoenix. And all of these things that I thought were just coincidences were part of a grand plan that was perfectly designed and customized for exactly the experience that I wanted and that I needed. I had a clothing line called Warrior and my logo was a Thunderbird. There you go. See, and here you are, you're representing. I, I, I'm i interested to see, I could see the bird in that actually. Now that you move your head a little bit, I can actually see the bird. You know what's nuts is that on the side, and I have never published any of this, but on the west outside wall of the Great Pyramid, on each of the walls, on each of the faces of the Great Pyramid, you can actually find things that should not be there. Right. There's a clear design on the south wall, on the outside, of an omega, like legit omega symbol and a snake coming down the side from the top, down. And there's a snake going up on the other side. So I see very clearly. Can we go bull. climb the Great Pyramid? Can you work that out? You know, I, I, can, I can easily get up to the, the original entrance, which is a, bit, a ways up, but getting the climbing up to the Great Pyramid, oh, that's tough. The reason it's tough, I tell you what we can do. We can do one of those like parasailing flights and go right over the top of it and like hover on top of it for a little while. They let you do that. That's but, and, and you can actually see the stuff. There's like writing up on the top and everything. It's pretty cool. And you can do it on top of all three pyramids. So I, I might do that my next trip to Egypt, right? Where you fly on one of these things. Pretty cool. Pretty, pretty bitching. But the, the point is on the west wall of the outside of the Great Pyramid is almost identical shape. I'll send you the picture. Hmm. to what's behind you. Now, you could say, but the pyramid was covered in casing stones. Those things aren't supposed to be there. Well, hmm. there's clear indentations and you will see it. And as we get better and better at starting to perceive patterns in our life, yeah. we start to perceive patterns in the world around us better too. Yeah. And those patterns are the clues to entering higher doorways of awareness. Yeah. Right. The phoenix is on the west wall and it looks almost identical to the picture behind you, which is reminding me of something there. Oh yeah, it's it's pretty pretty freaky. It's almost identical to that. And it almost has a head like that phoenix does that looks almost like the shape of a condor. <laughs> so, and I have of course this phoenix behind me that I sculpted at the same time that I was going through all of this. And you sculpted that? Yeah. What don't you do? I don't do a lot of things. <laughs> I don't do a lot of things. But I, I do sculpt and I, I like that because for me, that was like a form of metallurgy of alchemy. You know, you don't have to turn lead into gold. You just have to understand that lead is the stuff that we've been judging negatively that can be transmuted into the gold of our new higher awareness. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. I see. Yeah. Like what makes gold the 
What makes gold the good one? Exactly. Perception. It's all perception. You see? I think about that all the time. I see like granite rocks and marble and things like that when you're hiking. And I'm just like, you know, or then you think of a diamond and you, th- or you see a, you know, a, an opal versus, a, you know, um, clear quartz. And I'm like, who decided certain things were going to be so valuable? Well, diamonds, you know that story, right? Diamonds. Yeah, De Beers. Um, De Beers, right? And it's funny because the word De Beer is a very important word that represented the Holy of Holies in Solomon's Temple. Hmm. The Dibirim is what it's called, the Dibirim. It's the Holy of Holies. It's the altar. And it <laughs> means the word or the truth. The truth. Now, the truth about De Beers, which is kind of funny, is that they have a cartel on diamonds to keep the price of diamonds artificially high. Yeah. They keep all of this high valuable diamond stuff yeah. in their inventory. Supply low, demand high. Yes. To keep the demand very, very high. It's what cartels always do. And I found it funny, funny that that is the truth. That what we think is scarce is not really scarce. I mean, you could look at every natural resource on the planet and you could say, well, what's the most important natural resource on the planet to life? Well, it's probably clean water, I would guess, right? Clean water. But wait, from space, we look like a blue dot because we're covered with water. Mm-hmm. And why do, we have, why do we have to pay for it? Can't yeah. we, I mean, there's, I mean, when you're out in the ocean, a submarine or a ship, like they have, they have like water purification, like systems. There's no lack of water. That's right. I've, I've spent the night on an aircraft carrier and I can tell you they make 50 million gallons of clean water every day Yeah. on an aircraft carrier from yeah. seawater. Yeah. So this yeah. is all it's a, bunch well, of bullshit. it's a bunch of bullshit. So what happens is you take the water and you put it in a bottle and it becomes now a unit of scarcity, a unit of separation. The same is true for energy. Energy is all around us. One hydrogen atom could power the entire earth for a thousand years. Dude, our hearts, how much electromagnetic frequency comes off of our hearts? Tons, tons. We have this thing called the SA node and the AV junction right, right in the center of our hearts. And we have these bundles of nerves. I used to work in electrophysiology. That was, I was started my career as a cardiac tech in electrophysiology. And it's incredible, the electricity of the heart. And it all starts from the sodium potassium pump. It's a very simple SA, you know, kind of ND thing. And we can, we can regulate it. We can regulate it. And then, you know, you have to be able to figure out how those pathways work so that the heart is in its proper function and you have the right ejection fraction, you have the right, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're avoiding things like complete heart block and atrial fibrillations, et cetera. But the point that I'm making is that everything that we perceive in this world around us is a subjective perception. And so that can be played upon. You start the construct in this blinded construct of duality. Mm-hmm. We start the construct with what? <laughs> with time. I've never taken a test. Was the mind. When I was done, when I was doing my hero's dose of mushrooms, it was the mind. The first the construct I had to agree to, to this reality was the mind. The mind. The matrix. The matrix. Yeah. So we'll think about the backdrop though. We take a test. The first thing that puts pressure on taking the test is the time clock that's on it. Okay. Sure. Right. So immediately we're thinking I'm running out of time. Sure. But even that is not true. Even that's not true. So wait, and energy and time have a one over X relationship to each other. So you could say that dollar bills are units of scarcity themselves to pay us for our usage of time. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we have water that is the most abundant resource on the planet. We have energy that is literally infinite all around us. We have, and we believe that energy goes through wires. It doesn't. It's an electromagnetic field. There's a great video on Veritasium around this. The electrons aren't traveling through those wires that we have. No, this was, a, again, a concerted effort to make everyone believe that it's all scarce. It's not scarce at all. Yeah. It's not scarce. Tesla knew this too. Yeah. So 
then you say, well, time surely must be scarce. No, not really. Because what if the whole notion that we die at all is an illusion? Which seems to be pretty true. So we just keep going through these different cycles until we learn to break out of these cycles. We learn to overcome these things that we've been told are impossible. Mm -hmm. That's why my next book is called Polymath. And it's about using geometry as a meditative practice to achieve a higher state of conscious awareness and enlightenment. And by approaching those problems that in ge geometry were intended to be always sold as impossible, squaring the circle, trisecting the angle, making polygons that are Fermat primes, uh, that without any measurement for any of these, and doubling a cube. All of these are the impossible problems of geometry, which have all now been solved. And the solutions for these are actually in the book and doing it all without any measurement whatsoever. For me, that was a threshold to cross into a higher level of belief system to realize that it's not impossible, but I'm possible. And this is where I think the world is going through this shift back to your beginning question. You know, it's like, are we evolving? And I believe we are. So the question I have for you, as you've been on this path and you've interviewed all these people in 200 interviews and everything, if you could summarize what you have learned through all of this, what has been the big takeaway for you? And of course, I know it's probably an evolutionary thing. I'm yeah. sure you're learning things all the time. Yeah. At this this point, is a big right? commitment you made to a journey, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and how, many years, how many years have you been doing it for now? those 200 um, three three years three or four years i started in 19. so you've basically gotten a phd in many many areas now of certainly of <laughs> podcasting but also of learning and listening to alternative viewpoints and perspectives totally yeah so what effect has it had on you mm. that well, one of my greatest lessons has really just been how accountable I am for my life. Taking accountability and knowing that I am in charge of that, as we've been saying so many different times, like, you know, you, it's you, it ends up being you, you're the world is a mirror, you're the one grasping and holding on to things. Um, and so I feel like the show has just continued to open my mind up rock my mind, blow my mind to just how much it's like, like I interviewed Neil deGrasse Tyson a long time ago. And he said that, you know, these are all the things that we know, right? These are all mm -hmm. the things that we know. And as soon as you ask a question that pushes that bubble a little wider, you have that many more questions and that many more questions on the peripheral. So there's more. So I actually, like, I feel like I, we really don't understand the nature of this reality. The more I learn, the less I feel like we understand. But we probably also are getting closer because you have to start asking the questions and you have to get curious. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think we're playing with reality in the most efficient way. I think that's very well said. I could not agree with you more. I feel as though the more I learn, the less I actually know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I feel more comfortable, in a way, not knowing. Like, I don't feel as stressed about not knowing or feeling like, shouldn't everyone know all of this? And, and, and yet along the way, I've had so many realizations, so many, that I'm just mm -hmm. like, wow, 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 wow. And some I published and some, you know, are still just in here. Yeah. But how have you taken that knowledge then of the less you or the more you learn, the less you actually know, and applied it into your life. How has it changed who you are and how you go about your day-to-day -day life? I had just worked to reorient the perspective daily. I asked myself, what's my part in this? What, what is my pattern that's attracting this kind of a situation? Um, what am I grasping onto? What, am I, what, what, what is out of balance? I just look at myself. Like, I really just look at myself as being, I look at my little universe and I'm like, how do I change my uni? The only way to change your reality is you. Yeah. So I just, I try, I just, it doesn't mean I don't have moments. It doesn't mean I don't have, you know, I don't get offended or I get 
irritated or mad or jealous or, you know, something like that, those things come up, but quickly I'm able to go, what's my part in this? What, what is it that I'm doing that attracts this situation? And I also, another thing that I've been doing a lot more of as a way to help me with these situations is I'm just trying to do a better job of connecting with my intuition, connecting with my body and recognizing that it's giving me information all the time that this field is resonating out of timeline, like out of sync, right? We think it's linear, but I think the body registers Mm -hmm. things not in this linear fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe by, maybe it gets invoked by a thought or something coming, but it brings in truth into the body. And so connecting with the body to see where I'm feeling it, what I'm feeling, and really listening to that sort of very, very subtle, quiet voice of intuition that's giving me information. Like I've even started doing like weird little psychic practices where I think about my interview for the day, my interviews for the day. And I just literally close my eyes and I try and I just look and see how I look in these interviews. And I pick the shirt of the color that I see in, in the interview. Really? That's, that's like, I, that's how that's I've been. How you got the really, really cool yellow one there today. Yeah. I just saw myself in yellow and I was like, no long sleeve yellow. I don't have one. No, not one short sleeve. I was like, Oh, I have a little yellow sweater and I didn't do any, I didn't try anything else. I just grabbed it. And so I, I just like little subtleties of just how can I connect with my intuition and my psychic capabilities that we all have so that I can become really like, I think that it leads to so much more autonomy in life, which is just, I, it gets kind of complicated at times because life is a little complicated because we can't see ourself just what's happening. So, and so it's easier to not get offended. It's easier to not take things personally when I am oriented to my own energy so much stronger Then I know that this has nothing to do with me. But if I get out of, if I get messy with myself and if I lose touch with myself and my intuition and how I'm really feeling and how I'm doing, then I get easily sort of caught in, um, you know, negative emotions. Interesting. What has been during this whole journey, the most, if you look back on it, the most vulnerable moment that you've experienced? Vulnerable. Um, hmm. I think it ends up, I don't, the most daunting one was I was working with my therapist and she told me that no one holds the keys. I kept trying to blame everyone for things or want apologies to make things right. And she's like, no one holds the keys. And I was like, I was like, that means I have to do it all myself. Oh shit. You know, and I cried and I was like, oh my God. And it was sort of right then and there that my whole orientation with issues flipped. And I, as soon as that happened, then all of a sudden I didn't get triggered by things as easily. And ironically enough, the things that I wanted to change started changing on their own. It was like, I freed up the energy for them or that too. So, um, just you are the key. It's you, you are the universe universe inside you. It is your, your perception, your reality, and you are in charge. Figure it out. So true. So true. So if you could give advice or perspective and, or if you could do a push message to the entire world right now, like of one short Mm -hmm. message, what Mm -hmm. would it be? (laughs) It's a funny little quote that I, this is the first thing that came to mind. Um, it's a, uh, it's a sort of saying I came up with a, not super long ago, but it's that your life is your fault. And it immediately gives you like a negative impression. It's that provocative. Like, mm-hmm. like, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's it, you think, oh, screw you, you know, but then you have to vet the rest of it out, which is that if you're happy with anything, that's also your fault. And so just knowing it's again, reaffirming that, that truth that you're in control of your life. And your perception is what controls your reality and thoughts become things. The world is meant, the universe is mental. This is a mental reality that we live in, that your mind is creating it. Thoughts become things and your perception is your reality. The difference between excitement and fear is very, very small. It's a very fine line and it's your perception that controls the reality. It's interesting. Do you feel like 
the other like materialism messages that have been more the traditional academic approaches to describing the universe are resonating less today among the larger population. Like when you say this story of mentalism and that mm -hmm. we have control over our reality and that, you know, it's kind of in the mindset of personal empowerment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you feel that that message is resonating more and more amongst people? Or do you feel that it's more the older message of, you know, the, it's the universe is material. There are fixed I think laws. That there's a there's a rise of sort of the more the stoicism messages and the more philosophy based perspectives. Um, I think that are coming back around again, and uh, I don't know what kind of a horned loop we're in right now with this mm -hmm. information, but mm -hmm. it seems to be coming back around as um, sort of um, standards and um, their theories and philosophies to live by. Yeah. No, I, I would agree. I mean, I've noticed as well that some of the older messages, particularly whether they're academic orientation, you know, the orientation of it is academic or governmental or large institutional or even religious, that the message for some reason I'm feeling like is just becoming less and less um, compelling. Whereas 10 years ago, it was more compelling. Mm -hmm. today it's become less and less compelling. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a major shift in society, like major, major. And I notice it even with my own following. I think that's why people are thinking, you got people like Elon Musk saying, well, you don't really need to go to college now. Right? That's awesome. And, I would agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, and then you might want to get some education in there. I definitely want my doctor to know how to cut me open, but I think there's a lot of things that you don't have to. Yeah, I think I think there's some truth to that. I think I mean shit, I have a GED. Robert, I have a GED. Like I used to call myself stupid because it was easier for me to just throw it away and say, you know, oh, I'm not even some not smart, you know. Um and I finally had to stop saying that because my reality kept showing me that that wasn't the case, but look at that. I have a GED, you know? Like, so I have a question just... about that then. Oh, sure. So as a beautiful woman, did you feel when you would tell people that you were not smart, even though you definitely are, most definitely, um, was that a reaction just because it was easier to say it? Or was it that you felt like it would make other people also feel more comfortable? I Or something neither. else altogether. Yep, neither. I, I would rather me... I don't want someone to make fun of me or think I'm stupid. I'd rather just go ahead and call it out from, from the beginning instead of have somebody be like, Hmm, that's not real sharp. Uh, so instead of, instead of that, I thought I just, I just, for me, I just called it out and sort of, it gave me an excuse to not know things too. And when did that shift for you? Mm, Cause you're probably. definitely not that now. Oh, oh, you thanks. I, there's very simple things that you learn in school that I don't know. Um, and I am not very good at math at all. Like math is totally not my jam. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember there was one time I was walking on the beach in Malibu and this super smart guy who worked at CERN at the hydrogen or the collider. Mm -hmm. What is it called? The, yeah. The collider. Mm -hmm. the collider, large hadron collider, hadron collider. Um, and he asked me, Oh, where did you study? <laughs> and I was like, I have a GED. And he was like, really? Like he was expecting me to come through with some brilliant academic accolade, some university of prestige. And, uh, and I think that, you know, it's moments like that. And that was about, um, that was about three or four years ago, but I'd say probably basically like pretty much kind of when I retired from racing is kind of when I started to realize that, you know, it was not appropriate for me to call myself stupid. Um, and I feel like I had a few people tell me I should stop saying that. And um, so, yeah, it's not been that long. I probably only eliminated that from my lexicon um, like, uh, yeah, probably 2019 ish. Wow. Wow, yeah. you've come a long way. <laughs> you've come a long way, and now you're like 
spitting quantum physics. <laughs> no, I hope everybody understands. You're the one spitting that. I'm proposing concepts and ideas. That's how I feel like my mind actually works in quite a feminine way. Like, um, I've, I, you know, things have to sort of flow and take form and they like connect. And so I propose ideas and concepts and connect dots, but like when it comes to the actual math and the sort of that side of things, um, I leave it to you. Good, sir. So do you, I have a, 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 another question for you. Do you feel like you easily understand other women and where they're coming from? Or is it easier for you to understand men and where they're coming from? Mm. It's a little vague, but I do understand men very well. I do. I do. I understand. I feel like I understand both pretty well. Um, like, give me a scenario. Okay. So you've got two friends. Understanding, understanding emotions, yep. understanding. Yep. You've got, you've got friends that are a couple. Mm -hmm. And they're going through difficult times. Mm -hmm. And you're listening to the feminine side of the argument mm -hmm. in your friend. And, and you also know, you know, you, you, you know her well, and mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can empathize with exactly what she's going through and feeling. Mm -hmm. Or is it easier for you to understand also, if you knew the guy equal level of knowing, mm -hmm. um, easier to understand his perspective in what's mm. happening in the relationship. Yeah, that's true. I probably understand guys better. But basically when you said that, what came through as being quite clear is that usually women's problems are emotional and men's problems are rational or circumstantial. Like they're much more, they're, they're like a thing, like do this, don't do that. And women are like, it makes me feel like this. And so that's sort of like, I think usually where the issues come in is it's like, yeah, okay, that should be okay in theory or like, that's no big deal, but it makes me feel like this over here as a girl. So I feel like that's sort of usually, and I do, I am very rational and I'm not super emotional. So it's firsthand learning that gives me the, the skills in that category of being able to empathize because I don't take on people's emotions. I'm a firsthand learner with emotions. So unless I've actually gone through it, like you said, if I've actually been in someone's position, I can then have that uh, direct empathy for what they're going through. But otherwise I just have a knowing. I, I just, I'm aware of people's feelings, but I don't um, take on their feeling. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I mean, I would have guessed that you're pretty good at both sides. Yeah. Because yeah. my sense is I, I feel like you have a really good hemisphere synchronization going on and how you look at the world. And there is definitely an analytical side to what you say. And you don't tend to, I mean, you're still a, you're a woman. So you come at things from a feminine perspective. Uh, also, I just find it a very balanced type of experience for you. Yeah. Um, and, and so you know, the, the final question I have for you is if you were to look at the world today and write a prescription for it, mm -hmm. what do you think it needs? I mean, if you could literally just say, okay, I'm going to wave my magic wand. Mm -hmm. What's the mm -hmm. one thing that you think could really have a gigantic mm -hmm. impact on the world? Conscientiousness. Can you expand on that? If you took things into consideration, if you understood the repercussions of whatever it was that you did and how it made someone feel, you'd think twice. Conscientiousness about how you make someone feel, conscientious, conscientiousness about how you're treating the planet and what might happen as a result of what you're doing to it. Um, conscientiousness about taking advantage of people. If you actually had a high level, if people could just be given a dose of a high level of conscientiousness, it would make them think twice before they did something that hurt other people, which ultimately hurts them. So true. Danica, <laughs> such a pleasure to see you. That was I so definitely, fun. I'm proud to call you my friend. And oh my God. I'm so proud to call you my friend. I mean, if you only knew how like great it was for me to just be able to kind of riff on quantum physics and the nature of reality with brilliant minds like yourself or you know, any of the other, other brilliant people I've come across, like it truly, like, it's like a, it's, I, I feel like this, this show is really like very selfish for me that I do the podcast because I just meet people I'm fascinated with. And I mean, the, the, 
and it's and it's been a pretty pretty stellar lineup. So um, many. You've had an amazing you. lineup. You really have. You've had an amazing lineup, and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. Keep Thanks. on your journey. I think you're on the path towards that enlightenment and <laughs> getting all those different perspectives. Uh, it's exciting to watch, and it's not something I ever would have expected uh, from you going given what I knew of you before, which I was always very impressed by you and your accomplishments and everything, but it's just not something that was like, you know, you sort of say, okay, this is what this looks like. And this is what fits in with this thing. And, and then all of a sudden Danica shows up with this completely out of left field. Oh wait, she's doing like a whole podcast series with like physicists and stuff. I mean, <laughs> what is up with that? Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, hey, you know, I like to keep keep people on their toes, but it's really just cool that I get to show that side of me. I mean, it just shows how like I really do feel like my career was very much um, a part of me being able to have a platform and a voice and the ability to have these conversations and be able to help in any way to wake people up or um, connect dots with friends, you know, like that I feel like is a, a very fun role for me. And I feel like the, that racing gave me this ability to, to um, talk to the kinds of people like yourself that, um, that I can play around with like this. Well, thank you for being so amazing and for doing what you're doing and don't thank stop you. doing it. And <laughs> I think you're having a huge impact on the world. The likes of which is probably so much greater than what we could ever understand right now. So thanks no, very we much. We can't tap into all those dimensions at one time now, can we? So no, yeah. we can't. Well, maybe, but not not yet. Maybe later, but then maybe there's no time. Oh, anyway, yeah, that's right. <laughs> good seeing you, my friend. You too. Thank you. Thank you so much.